worship with the Lord Prince George's County Cluster of Churches. It is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, and we've gathered together to worship together to begin this holy season to uh, to begin this holy season together. Lent is a time of penance. Um, is a time when we are make ourselves even more conscious of the presence of God in our lives and also make ourselves conscious of our walk with God. We are preparing ourselves for the Easter season. We're preparing ourselves for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we are entering into and as we are approaching this holy season of Lent, we invite you, come on in and let's worship together. The Lord Prince George's County Cluster of Churches is made up of Journey United Methodist Church. We thank God for the pastor, Reverend Michael Parker Jr., who is the uh, lead pastor of Journey at Gethsemane United Methodist Church, and yours truly is the pastor of Gethsemane. And we together are the Lower Prince George's County cluster of churches. We invite you, come on and turn your volume up, open the door of your spirit, and let's worship the Lord together. You are welcome, Jesus.
praises right here. Hallelujah. Happy way. Shower us, God, that we may be cleansed to stand in your presence. We bless you for your gift of Jesus, who is the Christ. We bless you that he loved us so much that he died for us. So during this season, may we take serious what your son, our Savior, has done. May we look to you daily as we seek your presence. May we ask for your guidance in all that we do. And may we be obedient to your word and your way that others might see Christ in and through us. Come to us, O oh God, like you never have before. That we would recognize that something is different in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to give us breath of life one more time. And now with that breath, we breathed the peace of God upon other people as we serve you, as we demonstrate to the dying world that Jesus is Lord of our lives. And Lord, we shall be careful wherever we go and whatever we do to represent you, Jesus, and represent you well. And we are careful to give your name the praise, give your name the honor and glory that only you deserve. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture today is coming from Psalm number 51. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe out my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me of my sin. 
Because I know my wrongdoing and my sin is always right in front of me, I've sinned against you, you alone. I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you render your verdict, completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, I was born in guilt, in sin, from the moment my mother conceived me. And yes, you want truth in the most in, in the most hidden places. You teach wisdom in the most secret space. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for me, God, and renew and, and put a new faithful spirit deep inside me. Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Return the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach wrongdoings your ways and sinners will come back to you. Deliver me from violence, God, God of my salvation, so that my tongue can sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we all said, thanks be to God.
for the word of God. And the one who's delivering the word is Reverend Inger Muteteke. So Reverend Muteteke is the director of resourcing of, of the Coastal Plains region uh, in the Greater New Jersey Conference currently. She has pastored in, New, in the New Jersey Conference as well as she has served in Severna Park, Maryland. Uh, Reverend Muteteke has a passion for preaching, teaching, justice ministries, and community outreach ministries. Currently, she lives in Southern New Jersey. Reverend Muteteke holds a Bachelor of Arts from William and Mary, uh, two master's degrees in theology from Wesley Theological Seminary, and a Master of Arts in Social Responsibility in Sustainable Communities from Western Kentucky University. She is a wonderful woman of God, and we're so happy to have her today. She's got a word in her mouth for God's people. So I invite you to turn up your Turn, turn up your volume to hear the word of God and open up your spirit and hear what God is saying to us. God bless you. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Lord, open our ears and our eyes, our minds and our hearts to your word this day. Let it fall on good ground. And now hide me behind the cross. Decrease me, O oh God, and increase you within me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, friends. I invite you this day to listen for a while as I preach from the message title, Now is the Time. Now is the Time. Now is always the time to be reconciled to God and each other, not later, now. What you are to become, you are now becoming. My parents used to say this quote to me and my brothers growing up. And as we became teenagers and we began to figure out who we were and are, they used to tell us over and over again, what you are to become, you are now becoming. The quote was first said by American psychologist Carl Rogers, and Rogers was the first in his field to found and popularize the client-centered approach to psychology. This approach recognizes the client as creative, resourceful, and whole already with agency to change the course of their lives. In other words, Rogers believed that clients and therefore all human beings have personal power over themselves and their relationships. Now, after reading Carl Rogers' life and contributions to American psychology, I now fully understand the context of his quote, the one my parents used to say to us, what you are to become, you are now becoming. And in fact, my parents meant it the way that Rogers likely meant it, which was like this. Becoming who we want to be starts with the choices we make and the habits that form our character. My parents recognized that as teenagers, my brothers and I would go through many versions of ourselves and joy and disappointment and question who we want to be. They said, who you are to become, you are now becoming to remind us that we can't wait until some future time to become people of good character, people of integrity and kindness and strength. We have to practice being this way now because later never comes. And if we don't lean into being the person we want to be, we'll make room for other people, values and circumstances to shape us. Now, the Apostle Paul may not have told the people in the church at Corinth who you are to become, you are now becoming, but he did tell them something like that in the opening words of today's scripture passage in 2 Corinthians 5.20 to chapter 6, verse 10. 
The opening words of this scripture say this. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Paul reminds the Corinthians of who they are and are becoming, ambassadors for Christ. And because of this identity, Paul tells them that they should have one sole focus, to be reconciled to God. This reconciliation is not a one-time act that happened when they were saved by God's grace. No, Paul makes it clear that the ministry of reconciliation is one that Jesus gave to them so they could live as ambassadors for Christ, preaching the message of reconciliation to the world so that all can be reconciled to God through Christ. And this was a huge problem for the church at Corinth. In fact, it was the second time Paul was visiting them to talk with them. The first time in 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul visited them to address church conflict and talk to them about fully accepting the authority of Jesus as Lord of their lives. But this second visit, this one was personal to Paul because in this second letter, the apostle is defending his ministry to unrepentant Corinthian believers. Believers who valued Rome's success and way of doing life over the way of Jesus. Believers who spoke poorly of Paul and his ministry and questioned his credentials because he didn't look like or act like other religious leaders. Believers who believe that followers of Jesus are not called to example God's self-giving love through humility and service to all. And believers who believe that following Jesus does not come with suffering. Ultimately, people in the Corinthian church repented, returning to living out the way of Jesus. But the unrepentant few are the ones Paul has come to pleading with them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus's lived example of humility and suffering and his own to be reconciled to God. And Paul did not give them a future time to do it either. The apostle tells them that now is the time saying this. And these words are from Isaiah 49, but Paul says these words to them. He says, don't receive the grace of God in vain. For God says, at an acceptable time, I listened to you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. The phrase now is the acceptable time is translated as Cairo or Kairos in the Greek, meaning God's timing, the fullness of time or divine timing. This timing isn't governed by the hands of a clock, but by God's authority. Now is the time, is any time we are still blessed to wake up, still blessed to have God's breath in our bodies, still blessed to live, move, and have our being because of God, still blessed to be standing flat-footed on the earth. Now is the time, any time, to receive the grace of God freely, and repent of the ways we have not lived out Jesus's self-giving love. Turn around and live as ambassadors for Jesus. Now is the time. And the time is always now to surrender to Jesus as Lord of our lives, living as ambassadors for Jesus, working together with God in the world. Our culture has a few ways it says the phrase, now is the time. One of the ways is YOLO, or you only live once. The other way our culture says the phrase, now is the time, is through the phrase carpe diem. That's in Latin, and it means seize the day. Now, I'm sure you've heard of both of these cultural references, YOLO and carpe diem. But the way our culture interprets them is this way. Hurry up and get all you can, do whatever you want, live however you want, and be as successful as you want to be before you die. The way our culture interprets the words now is the time may seem fun and bring happiness, but it does not consider eternity. 
It does not consider Jesus' sacrifice for us. It does not consider how us reflecting Jesus with our lives could transform the life of someone else. Someone who is desperate to be saved by Jesus' love. John Mark Comer, the author of a book that I'm reading, it's titled The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, talks about how we as human beings made from the dust of the earth ignore our limitations to maximize time and space. Here is what Comer says. We live in a culture that wants to transgress all limitations, not accept them, to cheat time and space, to be like God. We To watch every new film, listen to every podcast, read every book, and don't forget the classics. Hear every record, go to every concert, drive every road trip, travel to every country. Another stamp for the passport, please. Eat at every new restaurant, party at every new bar opening, befriend every new face, fix every problem in society, rise to the top of every field, win every award, make every list of who's who. But we're human. Time, space, one place at a time, all that pesky, non-omnipresent stuff. All I'm saying is limitations aren't all bad. They are where we find God's will for our lives. Church, if we don't get this, we will have received the grace of God in vain, like the believers at Corinth did. The power in today's scripture passage is in 2 Corinthians 6.2, when Paul says, For God says, at an acceptable time, I listened to you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. These words highlight and remind the people at Corinth and us of Jesus' saving work on the cross, giving us the strength and every reason to commend ourselves in everything. That word commend here, it means to establish, to stand in, or to prove. Paul tells the church at Corinth that we are not God's ministers as a title, so others can be but so others can be reconciled to God. So the work being done in Jesus name will not be blamed and and here's the most important part. So that we can reconcile others to God no matter the circumstances that we face. Friends, let me say that again. Paul tells the church at Corinth that we are not God's ministers as a title but so others can be reconciled to God. So the work being done in Jesus' name will not be blamed and so that we can reconcile others to God no matter what circumstances we face. And Paul names all kinds of circumstances in this scripture. He says, by great endurance, by afflictions, by hardships, by difficulties, by beatings, by imprisonments, by riots, by labors, by sleepless nights, by times of hunger, by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, through weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, through glory and dishonor, through slander and good report, regarded as deceivers yet true, as unknown yet recognized, as dying yet see we live, as being disciplined yet not killed, as grieving yet always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, as having nothing yet possessing everything. Glory to God, church. Glory to God. Church, this is the good news, of, good news of Jesus Christ. That we can go through COVID, through hardship, through blessing, through trial, through wars, through folks talking about us, through folks tearing down our reputation and ministry, through church hurt, through family drama, through anything, knowing that God's eternal promise holds true in our lives. Hallelujah since the very foundations of the world. And that promise is this, I will be with you. Do not be afraid. 
So how do we activate now time, a time of repentance, a time of returning right where we are as ambassadors for Jesus? The first thing is for us to remember, remember that Jesus made us ambassadors for him through his sacrifice on the cross. And therefore we live out of that grace. We live out of that grace. The second way we activate now time or a time of repentance, a time of returning, is to reconcile ourselves to God and reconcile others to God through Jesus. Jesus gave us the ministry of reconciliation through his sacrifice on the cross. And so because we live out of that grace, God calls us each day to commend ourselves to the ministry of reconciliation in all things, no matter what we face. And the final way that we activate now time, a time of repentance and returning, right where we are as ambassadors for Jesus, is to return. Return each day to the ministry of reconciliation Jesus has given us in every season. We return each day to that work in our homes, in our jobs, in the grocery store, in our communities. We return so that others may be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, the Jesus they meet in us. Claiming this truth that we are ambassadors for Jesus keeps our God identity before us and gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to engage the ministry of reconciliation in all seasons. My husband's message to our daughters during the height of the pandemic and in quarantine was this. Now is the time to work on you, to accomplish something you have been working on or that God has called you to work on, to learn something new. Church, I commend that same message to you today. Now is always the time to remember that we are Jesus's ambassadors to reconcile ourselves to God and reconcile others to God through Jesus and return to the ministry of reconciliation Jesus has given us every day, no matter where we are. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your grace. And I thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you that by that sacrifice, Lord, by Jesus's example, through his dying and rising, you have empowered us to be ambassadors for you everywhere you call us to be. God, by your grace each day, Help us to engage the ministry of reconciliation everywhere you call us to be, no matter the season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, as we approach and as we go into this holy season of Lent, let us pause for a moment of prayer. Loving God, we thank you so much for this time. Thank you, Lord God, for this time in worship. We thank you, Lord God, for making yourself available to us. We pray even right now you, Lord God, come alongside us on our journey. Come alongside us in this Lenten season. We pray even right now that you move among us in a special way. We pray, God, that you clothe us with the mantle of prayer. Help us. Give us the desire to seek you more earnestly. Give us, Lord God, the focus that we need to be able to see you above the everyday, uh, the everyday actions and, and the everyday uh, movement of life. Lord God, help us, Lord God. I pray even right now that you, those of us who have made commitments to fast or to give up certain things or whatever the case may be, I pray that you help us and strengthen us, oh God, to fulfill our uh, vow to you. I pray even more so, Lord God, that you help us, Lord God, to grant to gain a greater sense of discipline in this season, Lord God. Lord, you said it in your word, draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto you, Lord God. So here we are. We are attempting, Lord God, to draw closer to you, Lord God. We pray even now that the Holy Spirit will come in, come in and enliven us even as we are seeking to draw close to you, Lord God. 
We pray for the Holy Spirit to give us strength to, to do that, to do just that. Help us, Lord God, to be, help us, Lord God, to find you. We want, Lord God, to see you more clearly in the name of Jesus. I thank you. I praise you and I honor you during this season. And we come against the enemy and all of his devices, which would seek to distract us, which would seek to get us off course, which would seek to, uh, to uh, help us, to cause us to lose focus. But in the name of Jesus, help us, oh God, even right now. Help us, Lord God, to keep our focus on on you. Help us now to turn our eyes upon you, Jesus. Help us to look forward to your glory and grace. And we know that the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. Help us now, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And we say thank you. We thank you in advance. We thank you for making yourself available to us. We thank you, Lord God, for revealing your glory to us. We thank you, Lord, for empowering us for service. We thank you, Lord, for using our, for empowering our hands to heal. We thank you, Lord for moving in our mouths and our in our minds, Lord God, and in our mouths so that we can speak your word. We thank you for empowering us to serve you, Lord God, uh, and serve our fellow man. We thank you even right now in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God.